Hi, Happy New Year, and welcome to Uncommon Sense from the Sociological Review. Now, as we've grown this podcast over the past year or so, I've got used to introducing it as the show where we see the world fresh through the eyes of sociologists. But kind of in the spirit of New Year's resolutions, I think I need to correct that for this episode, because today we're actually going to be hearing the world afresh with the sociologist Les Beck. We'll be taking some common sense ideas around noise, sound, silence, and listening, and flipping them around a bit to think differently about our society, its inequalities, but its possibilities too. Rosie, I'm so excited to speak to Les. His book, The Art of Listening, is a real staple for so many budding sociologists. But before we pull him in, I wondered... What do you think about listening to the world? I mean, is it something you've considered, perhaps in your own work on religion or activism, maybe? Oh, yeah. I mean, religious sound is super diverse, but also very central to many, many forms of religious and spiritual practice. I study Islam and you've got probably most obviously the call to prayer, which is ubiquitous and beautiful, I think, in Muslim majority countries. And it's heard five times daily. And I found it really a kind of audio and spiritual punctuation to the day. And of course, the Quran is recited in a special way called Tajweed, which is it almost sounds like it's being sung. But also one of the things about a lot of places of worship I've been into is actually silence, or at least this very, very apparent feeling of um, hush that's a really strong norm. It's interesting. For myself, like, I'm not sure if I've shared this before, but I actually played in punk and metal bands from like high school to my PhD when I moved to Tokyo for the fieldwork. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and recently I've tried to integrate that to the research and the teaching, to like by making music for quant methods courses. So oh, this, wow. it's like it's stuff that, that students feel, feel are very daunting. But uh, yeah, just making tunes out of stats. <laughs> I'm gonna try that. I love that, Alexis. That sounds like a very cool thing. I play um protest songs at the beginning of some of my social justice classes, but I definitely don't actually write the music myself. So you're like next level there. Um, I mean, th- there is really like so much that can be said about hearing and listening to each other, isn't there? I mean, I feel particularly since Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Bolsonaro in Brazil and so on, there's been this rush of conversation about how we need to have dialogue to listen, to talk across divides and so on. But we should also think about how we're listening, to what end, with what prejudices, using what devices, indeed, which online platforms owned by which influential entrepreneurs, and also about who has the power to be heard and who has the power to choose not to listen. Well, it's great to have Les here to help us through it all. Hi, Les. Welcome to uh, Uncommon Sense. Oh, it's great to be invited. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So it's a, it's a joy to be here. Well, as we admitted in our intro there, it's so easy to just lazily refer and think with the visual sense only to say things like, let's look at this, or I see what you mean, or even I couldn't believe my eyes, <laughs> as if our eyes are some ultimate arbiter of truth. For a long time now, you've focused on a different sense in much of your work, looking at listening. How does doing that expand the sociological imagination or its potential? Well, you know, I've really been interested in cultures of sound, not just of music, but of the the auditory aspects of life. But I I would also broaden it, I mean, in a way, the, the risk of thinking with our eyes is that we end up focusing, to use a a seeing word, on the big problems, the spectacle. Remember, you know, I think that in a way, sociology can be prone to focusing on the big problems, the spectacular, the big news, the, the drama of life. Whereas I think thinking with sound and thinking through sound invites us to to pay close attention to those things that are also going on that might be in the background, that might not be the big spectacles of life uh, and the spectacular problems, but also the mundane, the everyday, the things that are going on in the background and and to pay attention to that and, and the significance and unfolding of life. I mean, in a way, what I have always felt was a an important invitation is to try and think within what Joachim Berendt calls a democracy of the senses. Because I think ultimately what sociology is about is leading an attentive life. 
thinking about it, these kinds of words around sound and music and, and like these kinds of analogies, they, they've really gone into the, the mainstream. So words like harmonious and dissonant are used to, uh, and maybe even reserved for describing how society is functioning or malfunctioning. What do you say to that? I mean, is the use of the words actually an exception to this spectacle obsessed society we just described, or are they somehow like part of it? Well, I don't think there's any, there aren't any words that are outside these processes of ethics, of judgment, and the consequences of the words that we use to try and make sense. So in, in a way, Alexis, I think the important thing is to realize that all words are implicated in, in judgments and, and decisions that we make to understand the world. And that process involves methods, literally how we do it, but also it involves making moral and political judgments about it. So I don't think there's anything about listening or sound that is inherently superior to looking. The idea of listening can be just as easily debased by the projects of power as looking. Famously, Michel Foucault talked about the panopticon, the prison where the prisoner would constantly be being seen. It's sometimes forgotten or overlooked, but it was also the panopticon, Jeremy Bentham's prison, model prison, was also a listening device. You know, so there isn't anything inherent about listening that's ethically or morally superior. I think what we need to develop are a kind of ethical and political understanding of the consequences of how we attend to the world and try and make sense of it. Les, you yourself are a musician, a guitarist, I believe, and you've been writing about how many sociologists are or have been musicians. Emma Jackson, Howard Becker, now we know Alexis Hutrong as well. Why do you think that is? Uh, a critic would say it's just because maybe sociologists have too much time on their hands. But as someone who plays the piano quite badly, to be honest, with no time to practice, that's probably not the reason. Yeah, too much time on our hands. I, I don't know how. I mean, I think actually we need to we need to spend less time in the sort of professionalized forms of work that academic life enforces. You know, absolutely. If you go through the list of of, socio of sociological writers, many of whom were keen musicians or had an engagement with what Christopher Small would call musicking. So going right back to the beginnings of sociology. So W.B. Du Bois, you know, one of my great heroes, writes this incredible book called The Soul of Black Folk. At the beginning of every chapter, there's a few bars of a spiritual. In a way, the music sets the key of this account, extraordinary account of the condition of African Americans. Du Bois himself was a good singer. He could read music. You know, there's a reason why his attentiveness to the sonic and, and music as organized sound leads him to say, well, actually, when it comes to the experience of, of you know, the emerging civil rights movement in Af an Af African American condition at the beginning of the 20th century, which he says is the century of the color bar, it is the songs of those communities that are the most articulate message is what Du Bois says of the slave to the world. And you know, Du Bois was a friend and, and contemporary of Max Weber. Max Weber writes the first really serious sociology of music. Max Weber could play the piano well. He understood musical notation. Much of his ideas about rationalization and the bureaucratization of life are rooted in the clues he takes from music. So it goes from the very beginning to our moment now, Alexis has been mo the most contemporary maybe example of that. You know, people like Paul Gilroy, you know, the great theorist of the Black Atlantic, incredibly accomplished uh, guitarist. I was just playing guitar with him this weekend, in fact. But, you know, Stuart Hall loved to play the piano. You know, there, it feels to me that there maybe are some clues, and, and I just finished a paper that's not been published yet in English, that's about the hidden musical lives of, of sociologists. It's a study, actually, it's an interview study. Um, and what's the relationship between an attentiveness to music as organised sound and attentiveness to society and societal shifts and voices? I mean, thinking about, you know, music getting recorded, but then also speech, which is something, you know, sociologists are doing professionally. You've written about 
the use by sociologists of what was once the tape recorder, I guess now the voice recording app or whatever. And your piece on that really digs into the assumption that by recording something, you capture something more authentic and true, that by pressing record, you might say, listen better. Can you tell me more about that, what your argument in that piece is? Yeah, you know, it was quite a radical, I mean, for 50 years, I think the tape recorder or or our devices that we use to record the human voice kind of held our imaginations hostage. And in in a way, the innovation of the tape recorder in the mid 20th century really transformed what research was and is as a a practice. You know, any researcher worth their salt would, first thing they would do is buy a tape recorder. But the thing about the tape recorder, on the one hand, is this radical potential to capture the grain of the voice. You know, the the capacity to actually capture the idioms of people's speech as they explain their lives and their reflections on it was a radical thing, you know. But in a way, I think the tape recorder also made us start to pay less attention to those things that couldn't be real. If it was on tape, then it was okay. Somehow it was real, you know. And if it wasn't on tape, then it never happened. And, you know, I think that that's, it's true to say that I think in a way our reliance on those devices meant perhaps we weren't paying attention to the things that we could describe through notation or, or written reconstructions, you know. Uh, and, and it's because so much, as Zygmunt Bauman once said, you know, so much of the stuff of life, the, the importance of life, the passion and the pain of life is unspoken. So I think, you know, Ned Polsky makes that point in a brilliant book called Hustlers, Beats and Others. He hated the tape recorder. He refuses, he refused to use it because he felt it made him pay less attention to the world. Yeah, so I, I guess the opposite of using a recording device would be something like, I mean, a buzzword yeah. is active listening, right? And a quick online search suggests you can learn to listen actively. Is that part of what you mean by the art of listening in your book of that name? Or are you getting at something a bit more subtle in thinking of listening as like an art or a method? You know, I remember when I was working on that book, I mean, it was a personal sort of um, crossroads for me. It coincided with the death of my father. You know, I remember sitting by his bedside, reading the proof um, copy of a book that I wrote with Ron Ware called uh, Out of Whiteness. And it was a real moment, of, you know, sitting there listening to the sound of his his diminishing breaths and the rattling chest. It, it really was, it posed a question to me, the sound of that. It was like, what is it you're doing? What's it really about? Who's it for? What are you trying to do with this work? And I hadn't realised at that time it was the beginning of of a sort of turning point for me uh, that resulted in the art of listening. And and the beginning of that project, really, or that book itself, is to say, well, actually, perhaps we live in a world which speaks so freely and certainly and that, you know, suffers not from doubt but from certainty. Perhaps we need to cultivate a more careful, doubtful, open orientation to taking the world in. And that's why I wanted to argue that sociology should be a listener's art. And and that process of listening isn't self-evident. And Primo Levi commented on this, you know, there's not only an art of speaking, there's an art of listening. And that that is about a cultivation of a sensibility. It's a sensibility that is both a practical taking in of the world but it's also an ethical and political practice and you know it's been lovely to watch other people really pick up those strands and push them forward I mean Leah Basil for example talks about the politics of listening I think listening is inherently political it isn't necessarily a good thing you know politicians like to threaten us with listening all the time and you know think about those moments those silences The silence of the therapist who hears you say some very, very revealing thing and just pauses. It can be about authority and control the process of listening too. So, and in a way, that's partly why it felt to me that, you know, our encounter with the world, the way in which we record and attend to the voices of others in their full texture and their full complexity, isn't simply about the sort of the facsimile of transcription. It's an ethical and political uh, practice as well as a disposition. And you wrote The Art of Listening a good few years before the rise of the events and people we mentioned earlier, Brexit, Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, and more recently far-right parties like in Italy and, and Sweden. 
Since those years, there's been a lot more said about the importance of listening to each other uh, across divides and so on. Do you think that there's been any progress made there, or is that discourse about dialogue and listening uh, actually rather superficial or, or lacking? Well, I think it can be utterly superficial, you know. It can be a way of placating people. I'm listening. I, I hear you. I'm listening. Well, that isn't really engagement. You know, it can be utterly politically superficial to say those things. And in a way, it feels, I don't want to be sort of smug about this, but it feels like, you know, some of those issues have become even more intensely relevant um, in the years that have followed, you know, not quite 20 years, but, but you know, a decade and more, you know, the, isn't, haven't we just seen the sort of silos of certainty uh, in the political culture just unfold at an extraordinary rate and level. And I think that sense of of engaging in dialogue that isn't about agreement necessarily. It can be about disagreement, but it, it means taking the serious, taking the uh, the arguments of one's opponents or even the enemy seriously, and interrogating them seriously and weighing them seriously, as well as our own argument, our own uh, ideas. It's why I think. Sociology should be about living in doubt in the service of understanding. That's what I feel I'm trying to do when I've got, you know, either my box of tapes listening back to them, as I've been doing recently, or my digital voice recorded notes. It's about that challenge. Les, I want to go back to an earlier point we touched on, which is essentially that of the fetishization of the voice, the delusion that there are simple narratives out there just waiting to be captured. I'm wondering, maybe controversially, about whether we also see that in the endless hunger for podcasts in the storytelling genre, for true crime, for example. I mean, in, in those sorts of shows, we hear the dial tone, the gruff voice on the end of the line. But just because we hear a phone call doesn't mean it's totally authentic, whatever that means. And it certainly doesn't mean that it's not being produced or at least shaped by the person on the other end of the line, just as an interview is shaped. Indeed, as this interview, our interview with you is being shaped by what people and ideas are present in the space, what assumptions and expectations and norms are brought to the table. There's a lot that I've sort of bought there, but what do you have any thoughts on this idea? You know, I, I think that the, the important point to say is that no telling or representation of society is innocent. You know, I think people's voices and the people speaking about their lives in their own terms, in their ordinary circumstances of life, is a really important thing to pay attention to and to value. That doesn't mean to say that there's a straightforward correspondence between what people say and a truth that's beyond what people say. And that's the sort of the lesson of the of the phenomenological and the ethnological ethnomethodological turn in sociology. You know, I think that's an important point to keep constantly to mind. You know, I love podcasts. You know, that's why I'm here talking to you. I love them partly because of the way in which they can be composed. You know, the idioms of people speaking in their own accents, as well as the soundscapes of all kinds of contexts and so on. All of that, I think, and music in that, folded in that too, I think is a wonderful opportunity. Um, none of it's innocent. It's all invested with decision, artifice and shaping. You know, I think that in a way, the task for us is to, in, to make ethical and political judgments about those things in life that we want to to tune our ears to, the things that we want to make louder that maybe are muted or not heard or, or made sense of. So those are all choices that are about judgment. Uh, and I think all understandings of the world involve judgment and, and interpretation. So I think it's a vigilant kind of openness to weighing those accounts. You know, I think in, in a sense what a sociology degree can offer students now is a capacity to weigh and judge the circulation of not only information, but of experience and the staging of that, whether it be in a true crime podcast or, or on the BBC News. Les, much of your work on listening is wrapped up in attending to racism and inequality. 
And you do that in a piece that you wrote with Emma Jackson and Agatha Lysiak uh, a couple of years back, exploring the fear of foreign sounds and languages in two cities, actually London and Berlin. Could you tell us like, why those two cities specifically, they're both typically seen as pretty cosmopolitan, ostensibly welcoming? It was largely through a, an accident, to be honest with you. All of us, in fact, Agatha, um, Emma and I had spent time in both of those cities and were fascinated by those cities. But beyond the cities themselves, I think we, all of us, were curious about, on the one hand, the way in which the, fo the forces of hate, really, were being articulated. And, and the sociology of racism has relied heavily on understanding racism as a discourse or an ideology, as patterned forms of speech. You know, so in a way, the analysis of racism has been to focus on the shape of its grammar and its rhetoric and to focus on the explicit expression of racial power. And I, But I think what Emma and Agatha and I started to realise or to be thinking about is what actually the effective power of racism isn't necessarily only in explicit language that in a way that the power of racism and its effects had moved into the unspoken. You know, it might use language as a sign of difference, but it didn't necessarily articulate itself explicitly. And so we started to sort of think about, well, if that's the case, if, if, it's, if it really, in a way, even the most ardent uh, racists realize they can't say openly racist things in crude ways anymore, how does the expression and the um, impact of racial power work and unfold? So that's why we started to think, well, okay, maybe there's something in the aversion to particular sounds or the promotion of particular sounds and in the sonic landscape that is the medium through which racism was, is operating. Speaking of language and going beyond it, we normally avoid jargon at, here at Uncommon Sense, but on this episode we're going to make an exception because one of the terms you use to talk about all of this is just a phenomenal word, xenoglossophobia. Can you explain that, though, with an example for us? You know, I don't like jargon either. I mean, I, I, the thing about sociologists is we are language lovers. We love language so much, we try to invent our own language. Um, I think that's a, a, an impulse that we should be, we should be trying to keep in check. But in this case, uh, and it's really Agatha Lysiak who, who, who pushed us forward here, which was really helpful, and I embraced the idea, is trying to find a way to specify a particular practice or, or a particular aspect of the way in which racism works. So it's, it's trying to be precise. So xenoglossophobia is, is trying to name the way in which aversion and hate can be focused not on the linguistic and rhetorical structure of language, you know, what people actually um, convey in communication in a language, but the sound of language itself, the sound of a language that is being constructed as out of place or unwanted. It's a stock retool of, of racist reactions to hearing a foreign language quotes to say, speak English in an English speaking context, you know, and, and the fact that people are speaking other languages is somewhat somehow suspicious. There, I think there's quite a famous example of the far right politician, Nigel Farage, getting hot under the collar about being on a train carriage and hearing no one speaking the same language. It's interesting you mentioned that, and I, I'm like champion of the bit to tell this because that train journey is one that I've taken thousands of times. So N Nigel Farage is going from central London through the multicultural and diverse neighbourhoods of South London out into the hinterlands of London beyond its kind of official uh, metropolitan boundaries. And, you know, as you move along that train line, you know, the train carriage this happens in lots of cities, the train carriage gets whiter and whiter. And the, the languages that are spoken on that train carriage get fewer and fewer. And, and, and in a way, his, his un disquiet, I mean, it's, it's ironic because, you know, Nigel Farage is married to a German woman. 
Um, but at the same time, it's it, the uncertain, the disquiet. I don't know. I can't. He can't quite say. He, he, he mentioned it. I just feel uncomfortable. That discomfort is an example of what we would call um, xenoglossophobia. It's the sound of the languages of difference that become focused upon. So a related word, xenophonophobia, that's the fear of yeah. foreign sounds, essentially, or I guess sounds that the listener finds foreign, right? And that's, that's interesting because it not only goes beyond the visual, it also goes beyond the verbal, beyond language. Yeah, because, you know, again, social and language lovers were interested in language, but, you know, so much of life operates outside of language. And so there are sounds like, you know, we mentioned, you mentioned it before the call to prayer, for example, the sounds of religious worship, the, the, the textures of, of, you know, Yasmin Gunaratnam's written a brilliant book called Death and the Migrant, and she talks about the sounds of grief and the patterns of grieving, you know, in the sort of white Europe, white English context, the sense of silent, hushed grief wasn't shared by, in the hospice where she was studying, by people from other parts of the world where grief was much more expressed and, uh, and, and articulated beyond hushed tones. So um, in a way, what we were trying to get to with this other idea, xenophonophobia, is the way in which those sounds can be the, 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 both the triggers and the focus of, of hateful dispositions. I feel like we're getting at a key thing here, which is that how one defines something that they hear as noise or music or sound will depend on context and will depend on conditioning. So like the piano at King's Cross Station in London versus a sound system in the street, they're both music in public spaces, but they'd be read differently. Um, likewise, let's say the shouts of a political protest, if you agree with it, and those of football fans that maybe you don't particularly like. And people also seem to get especially annoyed about what they might lazily label as religious noise. As a sociologist of religion, I kind of find that curious. Like, for example, certain people moving to an area with churches and then getting mad about the church bells ringing early on a Sunday morning, or conversely finding church bells quaint, but then being maddened by the sound of Christian preachers outside a train station. Sure, because, you know, it's all, it's all about situatedness and context and how those sounds are play and reverberate, you know. Remember, this is all about reverberation and movement, how they, how they unfold in places and contexts where those sounds are given and invested with meaning and significance, uh, whether it is significance that creates a kind of homely sense of place or whether it's those sounds are thought to be out of place or to be disruptions, you know. Les, we, we've been talking about fears and phobias of sounds and languages regarded as foreign by the listener, but I'm also wondering what your thought is around another kind of response to certain sounds um, and maybe their appropriation. I guess you might maybe call it xenophonophilia. Um, like, I'm not sure if that's a thing. Um But yeah, I'm thinking, say, of like the use of black spiritual music in electronics, electronic dance uh, music and festivals, for example. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the whole debate about cultural appropriation is perhaps to the side of our discussion today, but it's an interesting one. And, you know, my, my thought about that, and I teach these kinds of issues in, to undergraduates, and it's interesting to, I mean, all culture is appropriated. All culture is appropriated because all culture is learned. So in a sense, the idea that, that of cultural appropriation really focuses around, well, what is legitimate or illegitimate about the way we learn to appreciate culture and aesthetic things in life? And so, you know, I would say to go back to your, te your example of, you know, spirituals in techno, it's like, well, well, okay, well, what's, who's benefiting from those, from that learning or use or reuse? Who's being honored and, and, and being paid ultimately and rewarded in that process? Um, because, you know, the truth is that the soundproofing around culture never holds, you know, so sound moves. That's partly what's interesting about it. Now, in that movement, what happens next and how is it, how is it both? It seems to me to be about, you know, the bene who benefits and who does not, you know, and, 
I, you know, I go back to Du Bois, you know, that incredible formulation that, you know, the spirituals are the articulate message to the world. They're a gift to the world. You can't steal a gift, as the jazz musician Dick Gizzy Gillespie once said. But you can certainly um, misuse a gift or you can certainly um, exploit a gift. Thanks, Les. Well, in a moment, we're going to move to take on a trope that's used in everything from counterterrorism work to relationship advice columns, which is the idea that we should simply trust our senses and act on them. But first, a quick word from Alice, our producer. Hi, and thanks for listening to Uncommon Sense from the Sociological Review, where we're wrapping up series one with Les Back. If you're new to us and you'd like to hear more in the coming year, and let's face it, 2023 is going to need all the critical thinking we can get, then sit tight for series two, launching really soon, or you can dig into our archive right now. There you'll find conversations about everything from emojis to enchantment, self-care to self-build, Borders to Bodies, with thinkers like Bev Skeggs, Nandita Sharma and Mikola Benson. And with every single episode, you'll also find reading lists full of surprising recommendations, old and new, academic and otherwise, to share with friends, family, with the students in your life. You can find all of that via the podcast page at thesociologicalreview.org or in the app you're using to hear this now. Speaking of which, if you've not already done so, please do take a moment, and it really does literally take a moment, to follow us in the app where you find your podcasts. It helps us to keep bringing Uncommon Sense to you. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you very soon. Right, this is a part of the show where we like to look at a trope that's really taken hold, but that we really stop to question. So something that we think is common sense, but that might not in fact be so natural or straightforward. Recently, we have looked at some great stuff. So the idea that urban life is mean and lonely in our show on cities or at the meaning of decolonization in our episode on the notion of being native with Dandita Sharma. But today, Les, we wanted to talk to you about the idea that we should trust our senses, something you explore in another piece of yours. Les, I think we mentioned counterterrorism earlier. How are we encouraged to trust our senses? What examples are there from the UK? Yeah, well, you know, when I was finishing the art of listening, I was traveling around London and virtually in every um, tube car, there was a poster. It said, trust your senses. If you see here... Anything suspicious, report it, you know. And it just really struck me. I thought, trust your senses. Hmm. Should we trust our senses? Well, our senses aren't somehow innate or natural gifts to us. Our senses are trained. Our our senses are educated to see some differences and to see others as not being significant, to see some people as being threatening, depending on who you are, and others to be to, to be unthreatening presences. So, you know, the whole history of um, of racism in, in modernity is about the education of the senses. And this is a point I take from Paul Gilroy's writing, which I, it seems such a pro- profoundly true thing. You know, it's about the education of senses in a way we should, I, f- I feel, and, and it comes from Franz Fanon, you know, the great anti-colonial writer too. He, he says that our sense of humanity itself is amputated from us. And, and, and with that, our capacity to, to see and understand and, and, and take the world in uh, through the power of racism itself and, and colonisation. And part of the task is not to trust our senses, but to interrogate them and to repair them, depending on who you are and how you're positioned within that history. So the problem is that our senses and their interpretation and how we're socialised into that can't ever be separated. But also just on the practical level, there's also the simple fact that not everyone can actually hear equally or at all, yeah? Nor does everyone understand or speak the dominant language of the country that they live in. So we kind of risk exclusion if we just say, hey, trust your senses. Yeah, well, there's lots of things we risk, actually. We risk inclusion, that's right, and the presumption that we all hear the same. I mean, I think that's one of the things which is really important in in, in the way in which the, the sort of critical ideas around disability and disability studies are trying to sort of challenge the normative idea of the 
hearing subject, if you like, or and the seeing one for that matter, you know. I mean, Evelyn Glennie, the great drummer, has a brilliant story about this. And she says, you know, she would take young children who are seen to be deaf, seen to be deaf, I've said that consciously, they're defined as being deaf. She would take them to concerts and the people would say, well, why are you bringing these deaf kids to, to music concerts? It's a particular presumption of what deafness is, which is a complete stony silence, you know, nothingness, when it, actually the experience of it, of hearing impairment is as a huge range and the, the feel of vibration, you know, could have an incredible diversity, if you like. It revealed the presumptions of what lack of hearing is and how it is experienced. Yeah, I mean, thinking about that, that, these sorts of questions around inclusion, we've spoken about who's listening and who can listen and how, but it feels like we're now sort of almost flipping around to talk about who is being heard and how are they hearing and what are the, what power relationships are there, yeah? Like uh, I think that's something that black feminists like Hazel Carby and White Women Listen or Bell Hooks and her collection Talking Back have been talking about for a very long time. And, in fact, I guess the very fact that they've had to talk about it for such a long to- time points to a big failure of listening, including by many academics, yeah? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I think that's so true. You know, in a way a more decolonised curriculum or a curriculum that is truly open is a better curriculum in my view. Uh, and so it, drawing in those those precedents and issues, because they're really about, you know, not only about who can speak and how to listen, but who is a legitimate voice and who does the talking. <laughs> and so that's where the whole thing about giving voice to others is is such a slippery and dangerous practice, you know. And I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, I would say you, the reason why we shouldn't trust our senses is because our senses can be drunk with power and they can be drunk with violence too, you know. Think about, you know, those those cases of, of people who are, who are shot and killed in the name of defending a society against terrorism. They're examples of exactly moments when our, the senses of those people upholding that responsibility are drunk with violence, you know. Um, but at the same time, I think it's true to say that and this is Fallon's great point, you know, it's not just the oppressive forces, the dominant powerful voices whose senses are affected, their sense of the world is affected. It also a sense, it affects the sense of those who are, who are colonised too. Um, and so that sense of, of being open to that process and being reflective of it. I mean, I, Yasmin Gunaratna, who I, is somebody I really admire, talks about this thing about going to the podium and feeling a kind of podium fee- fever that isn't about her own capacity. As a, as a, it's a socially produced thing where, as an intellectual of colour, she goes to the podium and feels like undermined by the unspoken forms of authority that, and the choreography of those places. Other people go to those to the podium and feel entirely enab- enti- entirely enabled by them. Do you see what I mean? So in a, in a way, I think it's being suspicious or mistrustful, at least questioning of our senses, is an important thing for everyone in different ways. So Les, on this important reflection on listening, how can we retune our ear to society and learn to listen again, to listen well? What practical steps can we actually take? Murray Schaefer, the soundscape writer, talks about cleaning your ears. There are practices you can do to clean your ears, to sort of start to uh, recalibrate your attentiveness and listen for the things that we don't normally tune our ear to or notice. But, you know, I remember going through a long list of of ways to listen better in a first-year undergraduate lecture and... um, one of the things I would I, I would say, I've stopped saying it actually, is that hear your own voice and develop a, a mild aversion to it. And uh, a young woman came t- down to the to the podium actually, to the front of the lecture theatre, and said, "You know, Les, I, I recognise that thing you said about hearing your own voice, but I've got such an aversion to my own voice that I can barely speak." And it was a product of you know experience of a young woman. Uh, and her the gendered nature of that experience, her sense of not feeling the authority, being enabled to speak. 
being silenced very often. And I, it made me more careful about that, that sense of those people who find the sound of their, vo- have aversions to the sound of their own voice and how, how that, can, that can be connected to configurations of, of power and privilege. That really uh, resonates with the a group that I did research with that had a step back and step forward rule that if you were used to the sound of your own voice, you should step back. And if you weren't, you could step forward. <laughs> Liz, it's, it's been great to talk today, but before you head off, it's time to, sh- to each share a tip for something not academic that makes us think differently about our subject, about noise or sound, silence and listening. So just a really kind of quick recommendation. What do you think we should be listening to and why? Uh, well, you know, forgive me. I'm going to have to choose some music. I'm such a big music lover. Uh, I love songs, the songs that are, are written about uh, city life. When I gave my inaugural lecture, one of the things that I did was have like a playlist of people coming in, a bit like you, actually, Rosemary, in that I, I, I play music at the beginning of a lecture kind of furnishes it differently, it feels like to me. And one of them was Ewan McCall's beautiful London ballad, Sweet Thames Flow Softly. But my choice is not from the past. It's a contemporary songwriter called Hack Baker, who I think is an extraordinary voice and interpreter of contemporary London life. Uh, you know, he's grown up, he grew up in, in, in the Isle of Dogs in East London. He was actually a, co- a chorister at um, Southwark Cathedral, trained as a choir boy, although he didn't fit in so well uh, in in the culture of the choir. You know, ended up ends up with being a grime artist and then a songwriter. And I think Hack's music is just extraordinary in its way. It kind of captures and represents the the ebb and flow of contemporary London life. I think Wobbles on the Cobbles is one of my favourite from him. It's the song that got me through the lockdown, actually. So, yeah, yeah I would say listen to Hack Baker. Now, I want to bring up 4 minutes 33 seconds, which is a conceptual piece of music by the American composer John Cage. And it's a piece of music where the musicians sit on a stage for 4 minutes and 33 seconds and don't play their instruments. And what I really love about it, I mean, I've never seen it in person myself, so, you know, I've only ever heard about it as an idea. But what I love about it is that the piece is kind of about silence in terms of the lack of music, but it's also about the ambient noise that the audience would hear during those four and something minutes, which kind of touches on what we were just talking about before, about, you know, retuning our listening skills. Alexis, what about you? Actually, I'd like to share something more along the lines of like a a cultural practice. And we have this initiative here that I I participate in called Walls to Bridges, where we hold university classes uh, inside carceral institutions with inside and outside students, basically. And our pedagogy is really inspired by indigenous knowledges and, and practices. And one of the ideas is to listen with an open heart. And so, so Les, you were talking about kind of listening with the body and so on. And I think that sometimes we might rely overly on kind of cognition or like listening with an open mind. But yeah, listening with an open heart, it's, it's kind of a different approach. Alexis, that was such a beautiful little reflection there. I feel like opening our ears and our hearts is such a warming message for us to to wrap up on. Les, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Yeah, thank you very much. No, it's been great. Thank you. And that's it for today. We're taking a short break next month as we warm up for Series 2. But we'll be back with you soon. You can catch today's reading list with pieces from the Sociological Review and more by clicking on the podcast page at the Sociological Review website or browse our show notes in the app you're using to hear this. Alexis, what are you going to be thinking about when you when you leave here today? I think what struck me most was kind of how Les made those links between the senses and in the hearing and power. And it's kind of like, I think... We tend to, to, to think about those things as separate and giving the senses as just being given, right? Something really objective. But thinking about those things in line with, with like those relations of power, I think that that's something that I really want to think about. How about yourself? I mean, I think I spend so much time thinking about the positive aspects of listening, particularly in the political world. But I thought that his kind of talking about listening as potentially in some context coercive or manipulative was just a really fantastic Mm. reminder to be critical and 
you know, in an evaluative sense about what we hear. And I guess I should also add, I have really enjoyed talking with the guests that we've had on the show over the 10 episodes. It has been just an absolutely joyous romp through sociology, um, but also very thought provoking. Lots of uh, interesting reading that's been brought up, lots of really fascinating conversations, and I'm so excited to see what is coming up. So if you've enjoyed listening to us, tap follow, give us a rating in whatever app you use to hear this, and please do keep sharing us with everyone because sociology is for everyone. And no doubt we'll need it more than ever as we see what 2023 has in store. Our executive producer was Alice Block, and our sound engineer was Dave Crackles. See you back here soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.